So let me know if you could see my screen. Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, please mute your microphones when we're when the presentation is going on. So um, that might make it helpful for the speaker. This is a quick agenda. You can see my slides. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so we try and avoid using the Zoom chat because we've got a uh, we've got a channel in Slack where the conversation can last beyond uh, just that meeting. And we've yeah, um, you can see our Slack channel there. We've already done our introductions. Um, if you've got a job, a Drupal job, um, that, or any any type of job that might interest this group, please feel to share that. And we'll have a talk. And after our talk and our question time, if you've got a problem with Drupal, uh, maybe together we might be able to solve that. And we've also got some time after just to chat. And so here are the organizers of today's meetup. And if you'd like to connect with us, please do so on Twitter and on Slack. And we always want to encourage people to be part of the, the Drupal Association. It really helps us as a community build a fantastic tool and the Drupal Association do so much. And upcoming events, Drupal Camp Atlanta. Um, we've got a mentoring summit. Maybe Amy June could mention a little bit about that uh, later on. Drupal GovCon and of course Drupal Camp coming up in, in October. We always need people to give talks and people to help us organize. So we've got an email address where you can um, get in touch with us or feel free to contact us via the Slack channel as well. And so every, um, Today, we've got our, our standard Drupal, Drupal event. We also have a lunch and learn. That's great if you want to learn during company time rather than on your own time. And if you are part of a mailing list, you'll get information about that. And yes, um, speaking, we're always looking for, for speakers. If you've never spoken before, this is a really safe place where you can feel comfortable to share what you've learned. You could either be someone fairly new to Drupal or someone who's been very experienced. I, for the first time today, I heard someone say they're new to Drupal and they've been doing Drupal for 12 years. So I am seriously a newbie as well. Um, but yeah, we'd love to hear from more of you sharing your knowledge with, with Drupal. Cool, so we've already done the introductions. So I have been um, looking forward to this talk and I'd like to introduce you to Jason. Oh, please forgive me for the pronunciation of your, your, your last name. I've got a complicated last name too, but Jason. <laughs> uh, Leffler. Leffler. Okay. Yeah. Cool. No problem. And let me give you access to share the screen. Okay. Well, thank you, Jason. Yeah. So let's see. Share screen, big green button here. And uh, let's do this. Oops. How's that? OK, uh, let's get started. Um, you know, uh, as I was putting together these slides, I realized, well, <laughs> business requirements change, uh, as you all know. And um, in the last few weeks, we've had some substantial changes to, to this project that I'm, that I'm going to de describe today. So I I'm hoping that this is part one of a two-part talk. And when the project has concluded, I can um, continue maybe in a few months. Uh, and, and uh, present a success story. Um, uh, so my name is Jason Leffler. I'm a site builder and front-end developer in Brooklyn. I uh, 
currently work for a cultural organization that oversees uh, two recording labels, a music journal called Sound American, and uh, an online scholarly music resource called DRAM. And it's the last project, DRAM, that I'm going to talk about today. Um, I should preface this by saying that everything I'm describing is presented from the perspective of a first time user of the Migrate API. And it entails migrating not from one source, but from multiple sources, uh, multiple formats, including JSON, XML, and a MySQL database. Um, there was also a workflow that entailed or involved a uh, text file or CSV migration, um, but I'm not gonna muddy the waters by going into that too deeply. Uh, that's me. And the current, uh, the current site, which is actually dated from 2008, and I'll describe the um, evolution of the technology stack in, in another slide, but it's currently at dramonline.org. Um, this said that, which I have mm. nothing to do with. <laughs> All right, uh, a little bit about my experience. I'm the program director and uh, sole developer for Dram. I've been a site developer, uh, site builder and front end developer since 2013. Wearing my, actually my DrupalCon shirt from 2013, which I've never worn. First time. Um, I've developed multiple multilingual sites for the American Academy in Rome, co-developed co a whole bunch of websites for uh, large and small arts commissions and organizations, uh, recording labels, and so on. Um, I have a lot of experience at the sort of where archives, libraries, and Drupal meet. Um, I think for the librarian, library people among us, there was one or two maybe. Um, Drupal is, has pretty wide adoption and uh, is, is a, a known, known entity, uh, no pun intended, in, uh, in library communities. Um, I've developed archival finding aids for artists' estates, archives, private art collections. I was on the Archive Space Technical Advisory Council for a number of years, which was extremely rewarding. Um, I developed the Drupal 7 archive space integration uh, that was taken over, the Drupal 8 and Drupal 9 integration was taken over by um, the University of Nevada at Las Vegas. And that's a, that's a great project that integrates with the uh, Islandora um, repository. All right, so what is DRAM? DRAM is a not-for-profit resource providing scholarly communities with access to audio recordings and related ephemera. Um, we work with 41 partner labels who are leaders in American music. Uh, we present the whole story of American music from uh, early Civil War music, um, uh, Native American first people music, uh, classical, experimental, improv, jazz, sound art. Uh, you name it, our collection has a representation of that genre. Got 200 institutional subscribers around the world. Um, NYU was one of our, it was our first test bed in 2000, I think. And uh, so this is a 20 year old project. Um, uh, every major music conservatory, uh, Every major music university uh, has a DRAM subscription, as well as another uh, number of arts and humanities research organizations. Uh, just how, how we got to this place, uh, how we got to, to, to be able to do a migration from a legacy project to Drupal 9, we were sit sitting around uh, the office in May of last year, wondering what we were going to do during COVID and um, applied for an NEH grant uh, as part of the CARES Act and surprisingly got it. Um, pretty, pretty big deal for us. Um, we're, we're a small time organization with four or five people uh, all, who mostly who work in a and r uh, and you know, they're musicians and I'm the only developer. So they looked at me and said, let's do something with this money. 
Um, all right, so a little bit about DRAM. Um, started in 2000 uh, at NYU. It was a Perl-based CMS. Um, worked pretty well. Uh, interestingly, DRAM sort of tracks the evolution of audio on the internet. Uh, 2000 was a big year for, for HTML4 and, uh, and what was then called streaming audio. I don't know if any of you remember Real Player, uh, but that was a big, a big deal. Uh, Adobe Flash was a popular way to deliver audio, but uh, HTML4 and then HTML5 came along with the audio tag. That uh, was around 2007. Um, and we moved to a Python CMS, which was like a custom content management system called Modu, which ironically was based on Drupal. And then 2020, um, I came on and finally decided, hey, let's move this whole shebang to Drupal. Um, there's a lot of benefits of having a de developer-owned CMS, but a lot of downsides. And there's one thing worse than vendor lock-in, and that's developer lock-in. And when a developer leaves an organization, all of their code leaves with them. You may own the code, but you don't own the knowledge. Um, so we decided to move to Drupal uh, with the looking ahead to the future for the fourth and fifth generation, and hopefully we'll stay with Drupal for a long time. All right, so um, this was the first thing that I came across when I was researching how to do this migration. And at the time I was terrified, um, but I learned to love it and I learned to understand what Adam was getting at. Uh, migrate is a beast and especially for a, I'm, I'm not a great PHP developer. Um, it, it took my breath away. Um, the depth of the project, what it promises to do, how it does it, it's extremely difficult for uh, a first time migrator to get their head around. Um, so I laid away at, awake at night looking at the ceiling, which was just a black screen in my head. And I thought, can I do this? And sure enough, I started like I do with every project, just break it down into pieces. I needed to migrate um, existing content from the current production MySQL database. I needed to migrate uh, allied information from a existing Drupal 8 site over the JSON API. And I needed to enrich both sets of contents with data from MARC records, which are in XML format. Um, so here's a representation of um, basically the numbers of nodes and entities uh, involved in the migration. I know somewhere in an earlier draft of this talk, I said something like 800,000 records, but that was based on a really sloppy MySQL query and which had a lot of duplicate records. So it was actually closer to maybe 250 to 300,000, which is still pretty substantial for a first time migration. Um, if you look at it from the top level, uh, albums are what we present on DRAM, which are collections of tracks Tracks are performed by people and ensembles. Um, so starting at the top, we have around 5,000 albums. This num all these numbers have gone up since the project started. Um, about 60,000 audio tracks performed by about 25,000 people. Uh, sorry, uh, 25,000 people are right. And performers are paragraph entities. So you'll have duplicate people and instrument combinations on a track. Um, articles, labels, instruments, and tags, those are all pretty straightforward. Uh, migrating media, this was the scariest part for me, but actually turned out to be the easiest thanks to uh, Drupal's pretty solid media implementation. Uh, it wasn't always that way, um, but I'm really glad that Drupal media is in core now. And uh, I don't know if you all remember the, the old, old days of the Drupal 7 media entity, but uh, in Contrib, 
that was that was not not a fun fun way to do this. Um, so around sixty thousand audio files in FLAC, which is a, a lossless or a compressed lossless audio format, and M4A, which is a, a compressed audio format. A uh, bunch of PDFs and image files. And then a whole slew of relationships that needed to be invented and preserved. So albums containing references to liner notes and artwork, tracks containing references to both MP4, M4A and FLAC audio media, um, the paragraph entities containing the performer data where one person can play one or more instrument or occupy one or more role on a recording. And then preserving the media relationships, um, album containing references to the images and document media and tracks containing references to audio media. All right, so how did I start? First thing I did was uh, read 31 Days of Migration on understandrupal.com. Um, it is a dense read. If any of you have taken a look at it, it takes a long time to get through that. Um, but I did 31 days in about six and learned a lot along the way. Took what I learned from that and went to the Migrate Slack channel and just asked a lot of questions and was prepared to offend everyone with my ignorance. Um, there are a couple of people on there who are really, really helpful. Uh, Benji Fisher in particular was really good about pointing me in the right direction. Often his um, response to me was look at this line of code in the Drupal 7 migration. And I was like, thanks, that's not helpful. Um, but then I actually went and looked at the code and read through it. And I learned how to read the migrate code which is different than reading just regular PHP because it's totally abstracted. And um, it, you know, it's like a Russian nested doll. You just have to sort of trace the migration back to, um, to the parent objects and parent classes. Um, encode comments really, uh, anything you do with Drupal in particular migrate, reading the inline comments, the annotations, uh, it's really the only way you're going to get anywhere doing anything remotely sophisticated with migration. Um, another thing that I learned how to do, uh, not being a MySQL guru either, I did a whole fat book of query exercises, uh, especially learning the ins and outs of join operations. Um, so in many ways, this sort of, I've been using Drupal as a front end developer, using templating, JavaScript quite a bit, obviously SAS and various style sheet um, post-processing, but this is kind of my first time really digging into the data structure, data types, um, working with the database, working with the database API uh, and working with the migrated API. So I really feel like I became a Drupal developer on this project. Um, I'm the only person in the world left using Vagrant and Drupal VM. Um, pretty sure of that. Um, everyone else seems to have moved on to Docker, but I'm happy with Vagrant because I'm a lone developer and I don't really need to share my work. Um, again, 31 days of migration became part of my migration stack. I constantly referred back to that. Um, so I just included that as, as part of my development stack. Um, migrate tools and migrate plus, obviously indispensable tools for uh, um, doing anything with migration. Uh, migrate CSV source. Uh, I mentioned earlier that there was a little bit of content that was in text files that we used to, to merge in some, some stray content. And then migrate boost, which uh, is not on D.O for some reason, but is a, a way to disable hooks while you're doing migrations to increase the performance. Of your, uh, of your scripts. Um, just gonna stop my talk for a second here and talk about some other things that supported this project. Um, I've seen a lot of tech talks in the last few years and there's all, always a, a, a discussion on statistics. So I included my own statistics here, which are 16 boxes of puffins. 
five large pizzas, a bunch of Sundays, taking care of my girlfriend's cat four times while she was traveling. I had two COVID tests because I went out of state. Uh, took a trip to the Jersey Shore last month, swam in the ocean. Two tropical storms, I guess now we have one passing through right now. Our office flooded twice and, uh, and we moved. So it's been a fun year. Um, all right. Wait, can you go back to that? That's important. What's that? <laughs> That's just a joke. Okay. <laughs> that was important to me. I actually took a screenshot I can share. <laughs> Good. Hopefully that'll uh, I'll go viral or something. <laughs> All right, so uh, just again, more tips on my, 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 my approach to migration. I started it from the inside out, um, started with the smallest possible migration, started with the simplest entity and the simplest field. And, and, I, and I went from there. Um, you have to build up these relationships as you go. Uh, you, you sort of have to start with the thing that everything else refers to and then build up your migration from that. Um, that was not obvious to me at the beginning. Um, you can use stubbing, but um, in other words, you can have a parent entity and a child entity. And um, how can I put this? One will stub the other if it doesn't find a relationship. I find that to, to be just really confusing. Um, the stubs are long hashes of letters. Um, there's probably a way to override that to make them less cryptic or less alarming to someone who comes in from the outside and looks at a stub content and says, what is this? Uh, especially if it's a stakeholder who has no idea how the tech works. Um, so yeah, so I started with the, the smallest possible um, atomic level, which was a person. Uh, in, in my case, a person is the performer of the music. A per person performs on a track, an album contains a track. So I started with that and built up my migration process from there. Um, I rolled back more times than I can even count, uh, having missed something, missed a field, uh, been unable to update a field, um, misdiagnosed or misapplied a, uh, a data type concept or had the wrong field type for a piece of content, um, had inadequate technical discovery before I developed the, uh, the content type. So um, yeah, that's just a little piece of uh, unsolicited advice to really learn how to, to use uh, Drush Migrate Rollback uh, to preserve your sanity and the uh, integrity of your database. Um, inventorying your migration. This was a little tip I picked up from JD. Um, he gave a talk about two months ago. Uh, he had a pretty nice way of tracking his migrations and the progress of his migrations and the relationships. And he just did it in a text file. Um, I, I thought that was great advice. Um, and it's something I would, I'm, adop I'm adopting now. Um, and then I use static IDs for files and media. I didn't want, I wanted my IDs to, to stay, um, stay the same throughout the project. And I didn't want them to be machine assigned because first of all, it's the most important part of the project. Um, but secondly, I wanted to be able to refer to an ID that was offline or in a text document and be able to quickly um, find that piece of content, that piece of media in the content management system without having to do a series of uh, convoluted joins or a, a, a naked SQL query outside of the uh, uh, a content hook. I just, I needed to know exactly where that media was in the system and a static ID that Drupal didn't necessarily care about um, was gonna be preserved uh, throughout the entire process. Um, 
Oops. Oh, back to the most important slide. Uh, yeah. <laughs> my. Hmm. Okay. Well, bummer. It's stuck there. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. No, really. Oh no. Okay. Well, I'll just keep talking. Um, let's see. You could, Jason, you could try stopping sharing and then oh, okay. change the slide and reshare again. Cool. Oh, I guess that's it. All right. <laughs> I'll just resume the share and I'll talk a little more. Uh, actually, I'll just talk. Cool. All right, so um, let me just show you. Uh, just like well, we're here. seeing a different view now. You can maybe just advance it th through here. This is large enough for us to read, no? Well, now it's just you. Yeah, it's just me. No, I just okay. wanted to show you uh, an example of a MARC record. And I don't know how many of you, I doubt, I think the only one here is probably Ho Ling is familiar with, uh, with Mark. Maybe some of you others are. Okay. Uh, can you see this? We, we can see everything. Yeah, that's and behind and behind there is D is D R A M uh, Drupal N Y C September misspelled. You know your 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 docs thing. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the spelling. Um, yeah, oh, sorry about that. I just just wanted no to make sure you, you knew we saw it. <laughs> okay, so this is what a mark record looks like. Um, kind of a mess, right? I mean, how the hell am I going to to deal with this in Drupal Migrate? Um, fortunately, it's convertible to Mark's XML. When I started at the beginning um, of this project, I didn't even know these MARC records existed. Um, so now, as I said, the business requirements changed. So this has a whole slew of information. Here's performer data, scrolling down, there's all of these performers associated with this record that we don't necessarily have representation of in our current database. So I want to be able to query this XML and bring it in to the content management system that we have now. Um, again, a changing requirement. Not quite sure how I'm going to do that um, because the source IDs are already baked in to the migrate tables. So I have to figure out a way to parse an XML file, add the source ID to each mark record and pipe it back into Drupal. Um, I hope to have a solution for you uh, the next time I uh, talk about this project. Um, one of the benefits of uh, Drupal Migrate is that as long as you have a source ID, you can do almost anything. Um, you can take a three completely different formats, JSON, Mark XML, and MySQL, and they can all go into the same. Um, they can all go into the same destination record. Uh, it's a little tricky making sure you don't overwrite fields and you don't uh, duplicate data, but this is something that I'm very much looking forward to accomplishing in the next um, iteration of the, of the project. Um, that's about all I've got to say about DRAM. Uh, happy to take any questions or receive any comments or feedback. It's got a really um, basic question, Jason. Yeah. So, for example, you bring across the people, and then you bring across the the nodes for the next level in the hierarchy, 
and then you link them together? How, now when does the linking happen? So th there, there's two, okay. So there's the person node, right? Um, and the track node. In the current database, there's what I'll just generically call a join table. Um, let's call it artist join. That contains a mapping of a, a person or performer ID to a track ID. So I had to write, you know, this enormous series of joins to get those two pieces of content to relate to each other. And um, I was able to do that with the migration lookup so that the track migration would look up the person ID. I guess I could have done it with entity lookup, but um, just using natural language, uh, using like the title field. Uh, I don't know. I just, I felt like it wasn't too reliable because it did not, didn't handle diacritical marks very well. If you had names with umlauts or weird accents, well, not weird accents, but with accents. <laughs> Um, it, it didn't, it didn't always respect UTF-8 in, in a way that was, it didn't, it, which would have been fine if it was predictable, but it wasn't predictable. So, um, I think the other thing I should point out is I was going from MySQL 5.4 and there were some big changes in uh, character handling from 5.4 to 5.5. My current production database, I think is MySQL 8. So... There, there are a lot of hoops to jump through to get to, to that. It was much easier to handle migration lookup than entity lookup. So yeah, so it was just, it was a, a substantial piece of uh, prepare row statements to, to get uh, two pieces of content to correlate and then, and then populate in triple nine. Does that help? Thank you. Yeah. And sorry, Dave. Um, awesome. No, thank you. This was great. Um, one thing, if you have for the XML, um, there is an open source project out there called BaseX, B A S E X dot org, which is an open source XML database. And um, you can just open up database, huge XML files, and look at it and play with them and play with X query and all that stuff. And then also you can write um, REST interfaces against this thing and kind of swap it to JSON and stuff. And if the databases get really, really huge, um, sometimes it's hard to parse those big, you know, if you run into those problems or sometimes you just want to crawl around and see it. Yeah. And, um, and there's other stuff too, but it's expensive and this is free. And I've had some good luck with that. So it's just, a, you know, thanks. it works. Yeah. Thank, thank, thanks for reminding me too, because uh, there, there was a, a really sort of niche piece of software, uh, an open source software um, based on Perl, ironically, um, called Katmandu, um, which comes out of uh, a university in Ghent, Belgium, which was essential for me um, in crosswalking from Mark to Mark XML. Mark is like a ASCII encoded format with no predictable patterns. <laughs> and XML was taggable and searchable and has an interface and an API and all that. Um, and you could also take XML. This is actually a great tool for anybody who needs to um, transpile formats, um, Katmandu. You can go from XML to JSON, CSV to JSON, vice versa. Um, and it's all it's all command line. Has a pretty well thought out API. Um, it's built for librarians and archivists, but I've used it for all kinds of projects. Um, some of these, these sort of GUI interface projects, like Exemplify, is another one. Um, Oxygen, everybody knows. There, you you'd spend a month just learning how to use to use it. And uh, it, it's just not worth the effort. Um, so yeah, just a quick plug for Katmandu.
would you mind putting a link to after the the meetup a link to those in uh meetup channel that might be useful for oh sure yeah i can do that in slack yeah. right yeah that'd be great yeah do we have any other questions yeah i'm curious to how long it took it sounds like an incredibly complicated process especially when you've got just one developer working on it yeah so i mean alongside the migration itself i remember when jd gave his talk a couple months ago he was like yeah i was just in charge of the migration i'm like oh lucky you i i'm i'm the program director for the project so in addition to doing the migration i'm also handling the ux testing i'm supervising the content editor i handle the graphic design and the um and the front end development um along along with the migration and the site building so yeah i mean when you work for a non-for-profit you wear a lot of hats there's just no no way out of it and um yeah we started we got the award in september and we had a lot of false starts at one point we were talking about doing this as a gatsby project um not not quite ready for that though i do have a lot of react experience um and really only got underway in may of this year um so i've been working on it probably i'd say 40 hours a week since then cool. so, yeah almost uh, five said almost five months cool. that, that not 40 hours a week for for the migration but for everything baked in together yeah. i'd say probably about 20 hours a week on the migration yeah. So it's like one box of puffins a week. And um, the, I was oh, David. David. Oh, I, I was just curious, when you are, you know, you talked about the rollbacks yeah. and when you're doing, I mean, did you have to go back to, you know, not an empty database, but you know, when you're building all yes. these relationships, <laughs> you do. Okay, so yeah, you hit the button and then, you know, how, how many hours later do you get the, fail you know that, that's a good question um well i i i i'd really be happy to get pushback from anybody on this but um i i just did not use any migration dependencies i would do my, one migration at a time because i didn't want to run um the word isn't concurrent i didn't want to run a sequential um migrations without some kind of uh check without without some content check and i did write a, a couple of sort of off-world non-drupal scripts to just randomly check the legacy database against the current database to make sure that the relationships were intact but uh, i'd say the paragraphs migration took the longest um that would take probably four or five hours to run so uh node to so you run the paragraph migration first and then the node migration with all the paragraph relationships um, comes after that and that package together would probably take four or five hours and i would just you know no hup no hang up and just let it run. And then I'd tail that into a text file so I could monitor the progress. Um, so some, you know, I mean, I'm glad that I have a, a lot of system administration experience because I, I know how to handle jobs and, and monitor them without crashing the system or running out of memory or uh, not knowing where I am in the process. But there were times, yeah, where I definitely like emptied the database, exported my config and, and just started over and then re-imported in all the content, re-imported in or re-imported, you know, the, the Drupal configuration back into the data set and then brought in the content. Yeah, quite a few times. 
real, really hair raising. I mean, for a first time, it was just a terrible project. You know, I mean, I learned a lot, but real, real heart attack time. Thanks, Jason. I think, I think the one thing that, that again, I just go back to JD's project because he just did his, uh, his talk two months ago. He was working with a, on a live site. So he had, to, he had to keep that site going while also bringing in new content. And fortunately, I'm not in that position. So it's sort of a content freeze and I can build my migrations as I go. Great. So if we don't have any more questions, we might have a minute where people can share uh, jobs that you might have available in your organization. Does anyone have any Drupal or jobs that may be of interest to our, our group here? Um, yes, we're, we're hiring actually. We're looking for two uh, Drupal developers. So if you're interest, interested, um, please, um, um, I guess, DM me, no, PM, private message me, and I'll send you the link. Cool. Thank you. I need a resource for where to find a, someone who's willing to develop a custom module where the business logic is more or less established. And it's a matter of, um, you know, building it, you know, taking a tech spec, a document, and then going from there. And it seems like, I don't, I don't know if there's a reliable place to, outside of this group, um, to find uh, a seasoned uh, developer who's willing to work at nonprofit rates. <laughs> I guess this is the place to ask. So where, yeah, I'm guessing you're looking for someone for a relatively short contract. For that's right, months. yeah. So that's a great question. I'm curious to, hearing, to hear the answer for that too. But if you were looking for a short-term contract, um, where would you look? Dave? You, you may ask, you might ask JD that because I actually asked, I was um, not Skyping, um, slacking uh, yeah. with him earlier today. And um, I had the same question. It's got basically sort of, and this is not even like a, I almost can't, I'm, I'm looking for someone to help me with basically feature development, you know, where like we have that, we have some sort of feature that somebody wants on an existing project. It's a module or whatever. And I can spec it out and all that stuff, but they're just basically coming in too quickly, so I'm kind of looking for the same kind of person, um, and he had, you might just ping him if you, you uh, on Slack, and he had an agency that or some a shop that he was going to refer um, to me uh, or me to, and uh, so you might find some luck there. But um, I mean, there's uh, maybe one of these groups we can both find somebody who's got some some time and availability. Um, and again, what I'm looking for is not a full-time gig. It's, I mean, it's yeah. not even really, it's just, it's kind of discrete stuff. It may be right. weekend or, F, you know, side thing. Um, yeah, something like writing a views plugin or, you know, yeah. so, something that's very contained. And JD would be the, the guy for that, mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would imagine, or, or would know somebody. Yeah. So just, uh, just this week, I was looking for some a developer to help with a really specific composer problem. And I looked on uh, Upworks, Upwork, and I, I in, uh, spoke with two different developers. The first person um, promised to do a lot, but from the questions, from the way they answered questions, I realized they didn't even understand that the core of the problem was the composer.json. But an, another developer I spoke with um, was was fantastic, and within an hour we had, we solved the problem, and we just needed someone we could hire for an hour here and there, and mm. so um, yeah, I'm just, yeah, <laughs> and yet it, it takes so long to learn how to do that. 
And then once you have it down, it's it's not just it's not it's not child's play, but once you have it down in your head and how to how to write that, you just just rattle it out. Yeah, interesting, right? But if, but if it works for people to work for an hour, then I guess it's you know the way the economy moves. Huh? Yeah, I had this really bizarre problem where I, I want to hear phone. about the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what was that, Jason? Yeah, it was a, it was what a really simple problem that had me um, stuck for hours, and so I was it was good just to be able to find someone who, who could, and another set of eyes who could look at the problem. Was it just some, some dependency nightmare or? So I, if I ran Composia install on my machine, it would install Drupal normally, but on my colleague's machine, when he ran Composia install, it would install the, 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 uh, the Drupal um, core modules in the vendor directory. And, Composer to JSON looked fine. And I tried it on other machines and it, it worked fine. Running com so Composer install would install Drupal in the right place. Mm -hmm. But just on his machine, it would install it in the vendor directory. Mm -hmm. and Which isn't bad. So, so what, was it, what was the solution? Unless, you, unless there's more to it. Uh, so the solution was surprisingly simple. Um, we just looked at, compared the Composer with uh, a composer, a very simple composer, dot JSON, mm -hmm. and we just stripped it back, looking at packages that we didn't need, and just the process of cleaning up composer yeah, seemed see. to fix the problem. We don't know what it was, but yeah, it works now. Huh. Yeah, it, it might have might have been um, um, a, a different version of composer on your on your um, uh, machine uh, and your and your colleagues. We, we tried that. So my colleague was using composer too. So mm -hmm. we brought that back to the same version I was using, right. and it's still. And still, oh, okay. So, you, so your problem's a little more complicated than that. But yeah, everyone should be on Composer two now. We, yeah, Dave, Dave, it sounds like, the, yeah. sounds like the real problem is on <laughs> Composer one. <laughs> yeah, and then you have to re, you have to re, re. I mean, it's not. It is re-engineering. I mean, it is because it's, it's not like plain English in there in Composer JSON. But it, you know, so you have to re-engineer the Composer file a little bit differently for. For, comp for composer too. No, so the problem, yeah, the solution ended up just, even though we were on the same version of composer, it was doing mm -hmm. different things on different machines. Yeah. But, but cleaning up the dependence, uh, our dependencies and just cleaning right. up the file to yeah. what we absolutely needed seemed to solve the problem. Yeah, well, if, it, when, when, if and when it breaks again, you know, reach, reach out, uh, you know, we, or we're here to help. Cool, thank you. I would just say, and this is going maybe a little too far into this, but um, the Composer 1 and Composer 2 should execute the dependencies the same way. Um, Composer 2 has a substantial performance improvement. Well, it's, not, it's yeah, go ahead. It's yeah. not just that, it's actually the, the um, I, I did it. I did it almost a year ago now, so I'd have to go into it. There's there's a, a large and well detailed page in Drupal.org um, that explains the difference uh, between Composer One and Composer Two for Drupal and what you should be doing with Composer Two for Drupal. Um, I guess I, I can, I'll put that in the Slack. I don't want I don't want to make myself go searching for it now, but I will remember to do that, and I, I'll drop it into NYC uh, Meetup um, Slack. Yeah, it's it's pulling from different repositories for sure, but. Um, yeah. Leaving us leaving Drupal out of the equation, um, the 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 performance benefits uh, of Composer two are uh, unbelievably great. Oh, cool! Yeah. Um, Thank you. So, are there any? And now we've that's a perfect segue into our next segment, which is what are some Drupal questions, challenges? Um, what's bothering you at the moment? Maybe as a, a group, we might be able to help each other. I don't want to dominate the discussion, but I just, I really, I really want to hear everyone's K or just a show of hands who's on Docker. Oh, I, I'm, yeah, I just, just built an entire, entire um, Lando uh, construction. Yeah, it's, um, 
Lambda is the way to go for for Docker. If I can if I can uh, take this take the uh, microphone for for just a moment, y you do want to go with Lando for Docker because uh, Lando Lando supplies recipes, right? Which you put into your dot Lando dot YAML file, and you just say recipe colon Drupal nine, for instance, and it gives you so much of your Drupal build right then and there, right? It really speeds you along. Right. And, and so your your configuration for a Lando app is is not trivial because you still have to figure it out, but surprisingly uh, compact, right? Like, I mean, our build our build for um, mskcc.org is, I'd say, medium level complicated, right? And I did the whole thing in Lando in I don't know less than a hundred lines of YAML. Which is, you know, pretty great, you know, considering what I would have had to do if I if I did this in Docker, you know, do, you know, like like just pure Docker, you know, a Docker file and just you know apt, you know, apt install and all of that, you know, it's just like recipe Drupal nine, bam, here's like ninety percent of the things you're ever going to need for a Drupal installation. So anyway, my, my two cents. Would you say that that it's overkill for a single tier development instance? I would not. Because the configuration for Lando is is very um, 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 flexible, and you're only really responsible for, like I say, that 100 or so, or even less lines of YAML than that, and everything else is just install Docker Desktop, install Lando, and you know, and, and write a dot Lando dot YAML file. And there's plenty of examples out there. The Lando documentation is quite good. Um, so I, I would not say it's overkill. No, I would say it's 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 less work than than trying to write a Docker file. Dave, I I, I would jump in that I mean, and I, I don't I don't want to start a flame war here, but yeah. I've been using Doxel for since it was called something else, and yeah. um, I think it was actually the first comment on the or the first person to report something on the on the GitHub thing, and you know I've got more sites than I can remember using that. And um, it just it just works for me. And you know, I can hit against Pantheon, I can hit against whatever. Um, and you know, I've got things where I can, you know, pull, you know, I, I can literally, you know, someone I can open a ticket and pull a site down with backup data or live data and the files and everything and boom, it's there. And I can work on one issue, deploy it and when it's done it goes away and i'm i'm just one guy you know so yeah, um, yeah it sounds great what's it called again doxel um, oh, doxel oh yes i've heard, I heard yeah. of this yeah, yeah. um but it, there there's a it, there, you know it's it's very similar i just happened to get that working for i i found that at um it was DrupalCon New Orleans, and it was literally the last, boff, you know, the last boff I went to. And I've been walking down the hall saying, "Somebody has to do this because I, you know, it was the Drupal VM thing. It's like it couldn't make it work." And you know, these guys were. It was just a brand new project, and um, you know, it's it's pretty mature. It's got good documentation, and uh, and it worked on a PC back um, when that was still mm -hmm. challenging. So. So, so are you are you respond? You're not doing a Docker file. You're you're just doing uh, Doxo configuration files. Yeah, it's um and you know you, there's the the command that you type is called fin. That's their you know because it's I don't know that's what they've called sure. it. And like if you want to say fin create and it gives you a, a thing and I was I want a Drupal nine and it makes a Drupal nine, um but then you can come up with your own custom commands so you can basically say I'm going to do a fin you know I, I pull a site down. And for every every project I have, it's just fin and it. It's the same thing, so I don't have mm -hmm. to remember much. And it pulls it down, and I can r sync stuff in from from different places depending on where backups and files are and what access I have. Um, but I can also pull it down from Pantheon and grab the Pantheon key and do all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And you know there is a doc, there is a Docker file, so the YAML file, but it comes with a stack. Mm -hmm. But then there's a whole bunch of add-ons, so you can hit Solar and you can hit all these other, you know, whatever you need, you can pull in. And it's, I've just, I've been a fan of it since, you know, well, whenever DrupalCon yeah. New Orleans was. Yeah, I was great. there. Oh, that's great. Oh yeah, yeah. That, that sounds really, sounds really good. But these are the, these are the winning combinations. I mean, Drupal VM was a wonderful product and we used it for a, lo for a long time and we're just about ready to retire it completely, but it was Ansible. And so, Add it to your list, developer, right? 
PHP, MySQL, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, um, on and on and on. And now you have to learn Ansible. So the nice thing about these, these um, 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 application level um, um, you know, VMs is they take care of all of it, right? Install Docker, install Lando, write a, write a quick file. Sounds like you're about doing the same thing. Yeah, and well, I'll tell you a couple of the other things. So I've got, it's got VS code built into it if you want it. Um, mm -hmm. And so you, boom, you can, you can do it. The debugger works in VS code in your browser. So that's a good thing. Um, and the other thing is I've got, you know, if, if there are, there is a project for whatever reason, you know, something you, you want to develop locally, great, but I can also, I've got a script that I can spin up a digital ocean um, droplet Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes you just need more, more power, you need something. Mm -hmm. And I can spin up a DigitalOcean droplet. It spins it up with all the stuff I need with, with um, Doxel on it. And then I can SSH into that, pull the thing down. And then, and, and it's one of those things where, you know, a $40 a month DigitalOcean droplet gives you pretty much the power yeah. that you need. And if, you know, and, and, you know, for me, it's like, if I need to, I can even build that back to the client. I can, you know, it, it's, it's kind of part of, of, you know, it, it's yeah. almost like having a, you know, in a CI, um, it's like spinning up a runner almost, um, but you can kind of develop on it. And also you can make, so I've got, and I'm, I'll stop the app in here, but I've got my own. So I, I've got a wildcard certificate on it. So essentially I can make these sites public if I want. So mm -hmm. I've got a ticket ID, so it can be project name, ticket ID, dev.ilight.net. And mm -hmm. it comes up in SSH and I can share that with a client and say, look at this and they look at it and then it goes away after I deploy it. So oh, sounds, um, sounds great. But yeah, but it's not, it's not like you're learning a, a, yet another language. No. Was, my my I, point I, about Drupal, v, Drupal VM, a wonderful product though it may be, it's like, I had to learn Ansible now too. Right, so. and, and any, you can write your own little scripts for it and stuff, but it's bash. I mean, it's bash scripting yeah. and, you know, and there's two kinds of things. Some of, some of them will work on the inside the VM, inside the Docker container, command line container, and some of the scripts can run outside of them. So you can kind of control yep. if you got to move stuff around or if you have to do stuff like most of my scripts, you know, well, you know, they may install SAS or they may, you know, whatever. So you pull this thing down, it installs everything you need. It runs a watcher, you're doing front end stuff, whatever. And then it just goes away and, and it's yep. contained. And just this one more thing, it's like, you can say, okay, for a migration, you can set up that PHP is going to be on this port for this one and this another port for another, not PHP, but MySQL. So you okay. can run two of these things and then they can talk to each other and yeah. on the same machine and you can yeah. migrate. I did all these six to sevens and sevens to eights doing that. And, but, and I, you know, I maybe could do a talk on that one day. So yeah, that'd be great. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I go back to, you know, MAMP. I don't know if anyone remembers that. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was my first development tool. Yeah, you know, got a lot of great Drupal 6 projects done with that. Right. So. Um. There's a couple of people who haven't had the chance to introduce themselves. So if you'd like to, yeah. Dad, John, and Hussein. Um, we had a chance to just introduce, say our name and a little bit about what, what we do. So if you'd like to please tell us a little bit about yourself, Dad. Yeah, sure. Uh, Douglas McCabe with the uh, CWA Joint Training, been a regular, uh, I think Scott, who was one of our instructors actually turned us on to the group and uh, regular attendee at the camps. And uh, we train apprentices on uh, Drupal and some other things with the, uh, in tandem with the communications workers of America. So that's what has us here. And we're also a, a, a signatory firm. Uh, I think I usually say to Union Web Services is a uh, co-op that uh, is affiliated with the CWA uh, as well. And we have, you know, our own business and clients and that sort of thing. Well, thanks, Dan. And John? Hey, uh, my name is John Ruby. I work at the uh, New York Public Library. Um, we work on the website. Um, it's uh, Drupal 9 now. Uh, we're also like, we still have some legacy Drupal 7 stuff and we're migrating things over one at a time. So uh, we touch on all kinds of things in Drupal and uh, 
um, just interested in hearing about everything, you know. Cool, thanks, John. And uh, Hussein? And Andy, if, you, Andy, if you'd like to. So we've got a, a bit of time where um, we can, we've still got some time where we can chat about any questions, challenges you're facing. Um, what's, what's a challenge that you've got at the moment? We might be able to help each other as a group. Oh man, it's a, ter it's a terrible thing, but uh, we've got that base 64 eval um, PHP injection on some Drupal 7 sites. Well, Just what is that? Uh, that uh, base 64 eval, it's a PHP yeah, I know. injection. Uh -huh. So yes, yeah. yeah, and it's uh, apparently it got into. I think it got in via the Civi CRM, one of the uh, Civi CRM extensions, and it's literally in every, pretty much every Civi CRM PHP file. It does not appear to have gotten. Everything's up to date. I mean, Drupal is running seven point eight two, and Civi's I think maybe one, three weeks behind or something. We might be on five point three nine, but. Um, uh, on the PHP side, on on Drupal, the files we don't see it, but we do see it on the uh, on the Civi CRM side in literally every PHP uh, file. Um, so you're saying you're saying this is this is a virus? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Have you, are gosh. you guys not familiar with the uh, Base sixty four BS? Uh, I can put a yes. link. If you yes, guys are. That's what I'm looking for. A little a little backfill. Oh, a little I'm, little background. Yeah. Oh, sure, sure. Um, Base 64 eval is a common uh, yeah. kind of delivery mechanism for, you know, yeah. the, the eval call is the important part. Um, exactly. And yeah, the base 64 kind of obfuscates it. So uh, you're supposed to avoid eval, right? Okay. Yeah. I mean, we have our servers. Uh, have one good thing about uh, being stuck in an older version of PHP is we have Suhos and, and like you can't call the eval function. So yeah, it's all about having lines of, of defense. And you know, if an exploit gets in, that uh, prevents that type of attack uh, yeah. since that function call just doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Yeah. We're yeah, that guy, that guy, yeah. I thought I thought I'd heard of something about it, but but so, so you're saying you, you're, you're able to see actual code injected into your PHP scripts? Yeah, yeah, I can no. show I can show it if anybody really cares. But yeah, sure. This is definitely no, this is definitely no time. I mean, come on, let's go. Okay, all right, all right. If we uh, if you guys want a moment, I here. can stop the recording if you'd like me to. Yeah, uh, yeah. I guess that would probably be wise as well. Thank you. So, um, thank you all for joining us via YouTube. Um, if you'd like to join us in person, we're here. Um, um, if you look for Drupal NYC, you can connect with us. So 